Please, in Edmund for Edmund. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to share this evening? Just uh, two announcements, uh, Chris. Um, yeah. uh, let's see, it'd be beginners group on Tuesday and uh, EAA on Thursday. Yeah. Oh, and I just wanted to talk to people about the Sky Brightness. Yeah. Sky Brightness survey. I have a couple of images, Chris. That I could okay, share. thanks, Brock. Yeah, that's good. And I have some images as well to show from SLU. Right, yes, because I saw you've been working on that. So thank you, Joe. Yeah, I don't know how many people we're going to get tonight because I think some people are away. But we will see. We have at least one person uh, at sea, so to speak. <laughs> yes, yes. El Presidente. You never know, he might check in. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, they should be connected, aren't they? I, I would think they are. Oh, I'm sure they're connected, but whether he can use it or not for video conferencing yeah. is another issue. <laughs> yeah, whether it's, whether it's sustained that and everything else, you know. Where is he at sea? Um, where had they gone? He Good was question. going to Ireland and they were going to head up some of the, um, uh, in uh, mainland um, kind of fjords and whatever else. Let's just see if he said where he was. Canada's Pacific Coast somewhere. He did yeah. mention the names, but I just forget them. Yeah. Okay. Geologists get into some strange locations. <laughs> so he, means, gone, um, he was between Prince Rupert and I think that's supposed to be Kitimat, but it came out as Kitanast, unless yeah. there was a place called Kitanast. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, there's some really big inlets that go a long ways inland there. I don't know if you can see my tablet there. That's just looking at Facebook. There yeah. he is. Anyway. And then he took a picture of himself um, uh, using the sext sextant that's on board the ship, which he says is the same um, type as his. So. So. Yeah, so he's up, up the mainland uh, coast there so yeah flying up to rupert a few a few times going to my fishing lodge that i go to uh, you fly over those inlets as you're coming into rupert and they're pretty rugged there's not much back in there i'll tell you and and the ice comes down awfully close to the water <laughs> And I was just looking back through our, uh, my notes there. So we have a speaker on the 15th. Is that still a go, David? Because you've been working on that one, I believe. Uh, yeah, I believe so. I, I'm going to ask uh, ask Emily for a picture, I think, so that we can throw okay. that in a future uh, Astro Cafe uh, invite. And it, yeah, it'd be nice to have that go out. Uh, yeah, and she has a little uh, abstract that we can use. I just need her. a photo or something like that. Yeah. Actually, worst, worst case, we just use the cover of a book, I guess. We do sure. that too. Yeah, if you can send maybe some of that information my way this week, because then I can put it in this week's announcement as coming up so that people get uh, more than a week's notice that we have another speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, actually, we probably should invite other centers across Canada as well. She's, uh, she's quite a well-known personality. I think other people probably would be interested in listening to her. Yeah, the the only problem was, of course, our Zoom limit. But uh, oh, right, right. Yeah, I don't know. We never we never push our limit, anyways. No, no, we we can. Uh, thank you, Joe. Yes, there he is. <laughs> and then he was making cider or no uh, juice. That's what it is. That's a lot of apples. Hmm. 
Uh, just as we're getting closer to start time, I have um, we have some Edmonton photos. Uh, David Lee has some announcements. Uh, Brock has uh, some photos. Joe has some photos. Does anybody else have anything to share this evening? So is astrophotography done for the year? Well, <laughs> we had our three yeah, days. And... Tonight, I'd say yes, but <laughs> processing time. <laughs> yeah. Nothing happening for the next week anyway with the rain coming through. Yeah. yeah. And and that's... equipment re equipment repair time too. There you yes. are. That's the other thing. Right. And working on new stuff. That's yeah. why you, you wail away at the at the telescope and the imager while you can, and then you process all winter. That's it. <laughs> yeah. It's like storing nuts, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, that just that weather just came in there and looks like we're pretty sucked in for a while now. So. Well, I, I was extremely lucky on Halloween night because I with all the fireworks and stuff, I didn't think I was gonna get my uh, assignment finished. But I, I managed to get the frames I needed. So and was before midnight. Cool. So that was it good. It actually was really quite nice out last night. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, outside of the fireworks and all the yeah, it was noisy. Emotions. A deer came strolling down the street and was kind of stopped and kind of listening to this all this all the bangs going off near my place there. And I think some I must have moved or something and suddenly saw me sitting outside and was kind of looking at me as if to say, Are "You making all that noise?" And I said, Who's that me? <laughs> They the think transparency they own the place. was awful, though. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't even try to look through a scope last night. It was just nice sitting out there and dry, at least. Well, you know, it was it was pretty nice. You know, like I I couldn't really tell if the seeing was all that great, but uh, it, well, it seems okay. awful. Yeah, the seeing, it, the seeing was awful. I looked yeah. at Jupiter for like two seconds and oh, okay, turned it off. <laughs> well, I was. I was I was photographing star fields and for photometry, it doesn't really matter. No, like, be, with the weather, have you ever tried using, cause you're just looking at stars, right? And then you need to process yep. them later. Yep. Did you ever use the St. Mary's scope? The Brooke no, Gaffney? No, no, I haven't. I, I thought of doing I that. I just you... put in a request. Cause when I tried to get the comet with M35 that night, I clued in too late and then had to wait for approval. So I got images that weren't on the night of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I could see I was in a queue with all these regular uh, variable star observers. There are a crap load of variable stars. Lined the, only, up. the only problem is if you want a particular time slot, you're out of luck because it just goes into a queue and it gets to it when it gets to it. And it might take yeah. days, you know. So that, yeah. that particular uh, telescope obviously has photometric filters then. It must. Right? Uh, Otherwise, it you could try. It. It's David oh. Lane as the administrator oh. of it. Okay. But it's robotic. You can just tweet it if you get you get you put in that you want to be an observer. Yeah. And then you can just do it through Twitter. You put in your request, and it puts you in the queue. And there's people that have lots of observations they want, and they become like the valued observers or whatever. So I think they get priority. But it seemed a lot of variable stars, a lot of variable so, stars. So do all the requests end up on a server someplace or yeah, they do they do. Only... then you then okay. you get a then you get a message telling you that your what your number is and you go into the observations made, you find your number, you can download what is it? Uh, there's a JPEG and what's the other one? Fits, this is, I think. Yeah, fits. And then why, you can do whatever you want. Demonstrate with how it. it works. If you know how to do it, why don't you just show us? I, I, my computer won't. I'm just on an <laughs> iPad. I'm on an iPad, so it's far more complicated than just doing it on a computer. Computer. Well, I'll, check it, I'll, I'll, ch I'll check it out. Yeah. See, it's called BGO. Yeah. Well, we, we, we gave up on the idea of going out and looking for Aurora last night when I checked with the guys in Edmonton and they weren't seeing anything. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, that was a funny evening where, you know, it was kind of like, oh, it should be here, but it's be great for Europe. And then it's like, oh, no, it looks like it's delayed and it won't be here till midnight or whatever. And what was it, five after all? I think Joe. Well, I guess I guess last night in Edmonton, yeah. they saw some stuff around five in the morning. 
but it was only 20 degrees up from the horizon and it wasn't very spectacular. So, yeah, my, my family kept on texting me and I thought, uh, I don't think so. And then they were so disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> well, there, was, there, was a, there was a lot of hype about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I yeah, haven't seen one word night. explaining what the hell happened. <laughs> on, on Sunday night, we went down to Telegraph Cove to have a look, and there was kind of a hint of aurora on the northern horizon, but just a very dull glow, not no streaks or anything. It was pretty, pretty mild. Chris, if Somebody... you go back, if you go back into Sherry's uh, Facebook posts, she goes into a bit of an explanation about what happened, but it's. Uh... It was just the forecasting timing was off. Yeah, it was it's hard from Machosa <laughs> because we've got Langford to the north and Victoria to the east. So it really just washes out all the areas of the sky. That, yeah, Sydney's like it, in a what, much better location. Yeah, if it was to the south, the only time I've ever really seen Sydney. Sydney. <laughs> The only There's, time I've uh, ever seen hoping some of the guys would be out at Black Nugget Lake, which is Bortle Three. But uh, they didn't see much. Oh. The skies were my, good, but uh, not much aurora. My best aurora were looking to the south. Mm. It was like going through Orion, yeah. which was so weird. <laughs> it was. The most amazing aurora that I remember was we were coming back from a street dip at, to Jasper. And we got just about before Edson and stopped the car because the whole sky was red. <laughs> The entire sky, horizon to horizon, was red. That was the night that the Montreal grid went out. Ah, yes. The whole <laughs> Quebec grid went down from the EMF. Yes, and I, I lived in Montreal at that time, so uh, I remember that night quite well. Was, uh, yeah, we, we stopped and got out of the car and just looked. It was just a sheet of red from horizon to horizon. It was amazing. Hey, well, welcome to Astro, the first Astro Cafe for November. And uh, as we've noted, the uh, weather has moved in, so uh, we're probably not going to see much of the sky this week. Um, so on the agenda this evening, we have a couple of photos from Edmonton. Uh, David with some announcements, uh, Brock uh, with some photos, Joe with some photos, and Lori with an announcement. Is there anybody else who would like to share anything this evening? Uh, hearing none, I bet you can ch chime in anyways. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's get started. And David, we're up. Or Dave, we're up first. And let's see if yeah. I get into uh, so, play mode here. Yeah. So th this is a photograph uh, from Alistair Ling uh, from the night of October the twenty sixth, and that's Comet sixty seven P and the Crab Nebula. Comet's the green thing, and the mm -hmm. crab is that pinkish thing sort of lower lower right um, okay. and he says that the the uh, mm. the sort of pinkish thing to the left the orange dust cloud it's something called vdb 47 that's that oh, further up left to the comet oh there right okay oh, no other was other side see the other orange side. oh yeah there. that thing gotcha yeah that's the crab and that's the that, that's that's a pretty wide field because that's a 300 yeah. millimeter f6.3 uh, that that's a nice lens actually um, and he has a he says 15 by two minute exposures at ISO 1600 and he used a star adventure tracker tracker for that so that was kind of interesting he's been chasing that comet for a while it's got a couple of good shots of it that's the best of them that's and the, the comet one, that they landed Philly on yeah oh, the little lander so the second one is from Denis Boucher. Uh, that's NGC 281, otherwise known as the Pac-Man Nebula. And he has a, uh, an interesting refractor, uh, uh, a GT 71, which is a William Optics refractor at F5.9. He's got a field flattener on it. He's used an, what's called an L-Extreme filter on that uh, and an ASI uh, 178 MC camera, ZWO thing and he's this is 20 300 second lights and 10 300 second darks uh, so it processed in pixensite 
So that's uh, and that's it from Edmonton for this week. And as uh, Dave was saying, not too much uh, seen of the aurora there. So uh, pretty much the same as here. <laughs> David Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to mention there's uh, two SIGs uh, this week. There's the beginner SIG tomorrow night. And I think, I don't know if Lori's on right now, but uh, uh, Lori, Lori's going to pick a constellation for us, I guess, and um, maybe chat about how we can maybe engage more of the members of the group as well. Uh, the EA group is meeting on Thursday night. And um, I guess we'll just see what we're going to do for the winter, I guess. And the last thing was the Sky Brightness Survey. Now, we have met... Uh, as a group, uh, but I just wanted to let people know, I talked to Laurie and said a little bit about this and uh, uh, we still have to meet to sort of talk about the usage of the meters. So I think we're gonna miss our our moonless uh, week uh, coming up. So uh, I think probably the first opportunity will likely be December sometime. So, so it's there's gonna be a little bit of a delay, but that's okay, uh, I think. We also realize that it's probably going to span several months because uh, the weather isn't very cooperative at this time of year. So mm -hmm. we'll just have to see how it goes. Yeah, so if, if anybody wants to, to borrow it and has a Canon camera, I have a uh, 15 millimeter uh, uh, fisheye lens that actually produces the sky image in a rectangular frame. It's an older one that's been modified from the previous version of Canon to fit the, from the EOS to fit the new ones. The, so if anybody wants to borrow that, let me know. I, I can lend you that lens. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that, Dave, because uh, there's been a couple of articles I've been reading from uh, darksky.org, which um, talk about uh, using um, photographic means for uh, surveys as well. So there's, there's a kind of a complementary thing to using the meter. And I think yeah. I think that I think that's actually a great idea because uh, yeah, I I'm interested in so if you have a wide angle lens when you're doing your your readings if you can set it down so that the top of the image is facing north uh, and just take a couple of different exposures because what I'm interested in seeing uh, from a light pollution perspective is what's in the surrounding area that may be affecting the readings mm -hmm. that you're taking. Yeah, so it's a slightly different perspective in in the sense yeah. that you're, you're getting an overall view of the environment as opposed to a targeted. Z zenith, right. zenith view, yep. and it, it might help us maybe identify some light pollution culprits. <laughs> yeah, actually, a lot of people were talking about maybe upgrading the location points from ten year or eleven years ago, yep. and and I think uh, likely I we, we probably should do some targeted stuff because uh, I'm sure there's locations that we're going to be interested in uh, for various reasons. So yep. maybe we can put our additional ones based on things that uh, seem like we, we'd want to know, right? Uh, a particular mm -hmm. location. Yeah. Well, and, and a main one since then, of course, has been the change to the, um, the municipal lighting. Yes, yes. In fact, in fact, I just received my, uh, my new LED light at the end of my driveway. And, uh, you know, at first I was, I was kind of impressed because uh, I thought it left a very nice Umbra uh, available for me to uh, put my equipment, but, uh, uh, I think it's it's actually quite bright. Uh, it it at least perceptually feels brighter than what the sodium vapor. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, this, yeah, the sodium yeah, vapor that, it, did. And that might be related to the fact that which whose municipality you're in, David? You're Saanich. 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 Yeah. Yeah. They they've been using thirty five hundred degree K or three thousand between thirty thousand to thirty five hundred. They haven't gone lower. I I think I think it's. Um, I think they said it was maybe even three thousand. They they actually yeah, sent me they they sent me a spec. Uh, yeah. Apparently, it's American Electrical Supply or something mm -hmm. like that. And yeah. I did I did ask them for a light spectrum, but they yeah. said that I have to contact the manufacturer, and I haven't done that yet. But yeah. I'll go yeah. and see if I can find the out what it thing, is. The other thing that Sanix will do for you, David, is is they will put a shield on it. If yeah. You have some so they'll come out and put a shield on it. So you just have to request it. Yeah, maybe that might that might help a little bit. I, I I've just been using my umbrella, but it's not very good on uh, windy days. Yeah, yeah, I had a shield put on mine, and it's I mean it basically uh, yeah. it, it right at the side. I, of the 
just wish they, I just wish they'd gotten down to about 2,500 degree K and, and it had mm. a much sharper cutoff on those things. I think they're still using uh, what we call a, uh, they, they supposedly zero up light, but I'm not entirely convinced. I think so, so when you say a shield, does it remove the light from my property and just push it out to the road? It's in the, it in the American it. electric, it's, it's a curved piece of metal that's just yeah. Yeah. added to the back or the side. They can put it wherever they want. I know that fixed your well. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and, and what I what I don't know, I understand, because I've, I've been after him for a long time about changing the, the, the specification for it to get the backlight down to one or zero and to get the glare down to about two. Uh, but that pulls the light right under the fixture and they seem to be very reluctant to do it because they want to keep what they call uniformity. Yes. But on, on low volume roads, there's no reason to have a, a particular uniformity on the road. Uh, and I do know that they, they say they have the capability of putting uh, dimming and timing controls in on them. But again, they have, they have not indicated they are prepared to do that at this point. Right. I, I I've, I've, I, I've actually found that if I go deeper down the driveway closer to my house, that it's yeah. not as bad there. And in yeah. fact, uh, when I did my imaging, I needed to do that anyways, because my uh, the first two attempts, I, I missed it because I, I waited. Uh, I couldn't start until quite late. And QX cast was into the trees. So I had to go mm -hmm. deeper down the driveway and then I could still catch it. Yeah. Yeah. So what they did for me is they were the new light was lighting the front of my house. So they put the, as Brock says, the piece of curved metal directly in line with my house. And now it's cut the, the light off pretty much at the edge of the road. So they're kind of lighting the managed property and not my property. Well, that would that would be helpful if I just let the road and not let my driveway. That would be great. Yeah. Well, that, hey, that's what we've been trying to tell them. Don't <laughs> light your house, let the damn road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. like your property all you want, right? And, and, and the, the, the other thing that, that they, they aren't don't seem to be prepared to consider either is on really low uh, traffic roads, uh, putting the damn things on a dimmer or a motion sensor or motion sensor control dimmer so that if there's no traffic, the damn thing is down to like 2% or something like that. And that would make a huge, huge difference. Well, especially the lights support doing that, right? I mean, it's yeah, it just... the lights don't support motion sensors generally. You need a separate setup for that. They, they, yeah, they, that's right. But yeah, you kind of do and you kind of don't because the electronics package that comes with the dimmer, you just have to put the motion sensor, tie it into it. Yeah. What they don't like doing is modifying the structure to put the motion sensor on it. That's all. Uh, Brock, what kind of lights do you have in your area? You're out in Brentwood. Uh, we have a mix of things. We have mostly older uh, high pressure sodiums, but then up the street from me, there's a, uh, a light, one of the small fixtures from the um, uh, LED roadway lighting, a small Canadian company in back east in Nova Scotia. It's a LED fixture. So you're not majorly lit by LED at the moment? Uh, we are in some areas. It depends on where you go. Okay. Further, my my neighborhood's just got some older fixtures in it and haven't upgraded them. Mm. But uh, and what's that I, greenhouse using? Do you know, I do LED lighting for a living, so I'm pretty versed in. You no, know, that big the big greenhouses out there. What are they using inside? Are they? Um, uh, they must be high pressure sodium. Oh, they are so. Yeah, based on the color. Right. It's. And it makes sense because it's pretty inexpensive to deal with. So, great. Okay. Well, so we'll um, more about that to come. So, I guess uh, is that anything else, David? Or are you? No, no. That's that's good. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, just drop me a line. Okay. And um, so, Brock, if you're ready. Yeah. Sure. So uh, let's see here. This one share. So I've been actually wanting to, I saw this object back in the summer and I thought this would be a perfect Halloween target. And um, it's called the Ghost Nebula. Can you guys see it? Yes, it's there. 
And uh, I saw it in the summer and I thought this would be perfect for Halloween. And then as the date approached, it, we get that awful weather and I thought I'd never actually get to it. But um, it's kind of an interesting object because it's kind of got this, I don't know, this thing that looks like some flying bat or something. And then it's got these sort of ghostly looking features which are Beautiful. all basically part of a reflection nebula. But then uh, as the weather cleared up on Friday and Saturday night, I set up and I got uh, basically ran both nights pretty much all night to get the data. It's still, it's amazing. This is a very faint uh, object. So to really do it justice, I probably would need a week of nights or something to get it really, really good. But, um, or a really dark site and 16 minute exposures or something. But, um, but it, it, in the end, it worked out okay. And then last night, I thought, what can I do uh, I, with the Erosa's lights coming on? This was actually done without any filters. So it was challenging as well because of those greenhouse lights that we just talked about. But um, then I thought I'll do something with my smaller scope and my MDZ filter. So I got a shot of the, uh, California Nebula, which was a little bit easier because I could just use the filters to, to cheat a bit. That's beautiful, bro. Thanks. I, I, is this the NBZ? Um, this Brock? is the NBZ, yeah. And I was mm -hmm. impressed because there was no halo on this really bright star. Oh, yeah, that's very nice. Because I know Dan did it with the NB1 and his uh, Canon RA. I, I think it's and, well noted. I think it's well noted that there's less reflection with the N NBZ. So yeah, yeah, it's a good choice. There's just no halo at, at all. Like I didn't do anything on that star, and I haven't seen any halos on any of them. So pretty impressed with that filter. Yeah, just... yeah, my my Borg is really sensitive to that, and the, unfortunately, the Borg's reducer is quite curved, so okay. it, it picks up this kind of stuff. Right. So yeah, so that was last night. Now we're back into uh, not so uh, good weather. <laughs> but at least the, I, I took advantage of what we had. So. Well, this turned out well. Thank you for sharing those. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, you've been working with a more distant scope that maybe has better sky. Yes. Yes, I do. It's, um, let's just get the share going here. So this is, um, I'll just scroll back up here to show you. This is uh, the Canary 4 scope uh, that SLU has on uh, the top of Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And uh, it's um, a 14 inch SCT basically. And just LRGB. So this is uh, 15 missions. So those are about 50 seconds each mission. So I'm pretty pleased with this. It actually worked out pretty well. You can see this next image here is just three mi missions and it's pretty murky. Um, I don't think though the, the um, image I took through SLU beats the one that I got from Gary Sedun's uh, observatory in Arizona. It's definitely has a lot more of the uh, detail filaments inside and the blue color is uh, you know, very, very impressive. So that's one. The blue light is actually um, caused by electrons spinning around the star. I hadn't realized that before. But I just got this right up from uh, one of the websites. It's quite interesting object for sure. So this is the result of a supernova that the Chinese observed in 1054. Um, it was a daylight object for people who don't know. It was uh, exceedingly bright supernova. Uh, next thing I guess is just to ask if anyone else uh, was observing Jupiter, Saturn and Venus this week when we had clear skies, it's still yeah, up there, of course. I, actually, I was showing the trick-or-treaters 
I have a direct southern view, so we saw all three actually across the horizon. Oh, perfect. Yeah, this is just a cell phone shot, but I, I just thought it would be uh, worthwhile asking people. I got a um, chance to look at Venus with my dog well, uh, two nights ago, and it was pretty noisy, like the seeing was pretty awful. Yeah. Dancing around. Yeah, Venus is so low in the sky. It's yeah. uh, pretty pathetic. And as Bill was saying, the uh, the air around has not been terribly stable. I haven't done any really uh, zoomed in observing where I was trying to pick up Jupiter's moons or anything like that or detail on the planet mm -hmm. for quite some time. Anyway, on to the next one. Uh, Tarantula Nebula is in the southern sky in Dorado. It's part of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, so it's in the local group. And it's a pretty cool. Oh my gosh. It's a pretty, <laughs> nice. pretty cool nebula. Yeah, it's very interesting. It, it is a, a binocular object oh, if you're sure. in the southern sky, if you're in the southern hemisphere. So you, you can actually spot it in the uh, large Magellanic cloud with, uh, with some optics. It's, it's not really large, but it's very bright. So kind of cool. Yeah, so you know, when the weather closes down here, there's always Chile <laughs> or the Canary <laughs> Islands. <laughs> yeah. So um, is, Joe, is the is the Canary Island one being affected at all by the um, where the where the um, uh, volcano is? No, apparently not, because they're on Tenerife. They're not on the main island. So, um, and I guess the the prevailing winds must be in their favor. Right. Because it, okay. it really hasn't affected them at all. Well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, very good thing. I mean, uh, the biggest problem with uh, telescopes and uh, volcanoes actually is vibration. I mean, it, it can completely destroy a mount in no time flat if the mount's being shaken at all. But they're far enough away from each island is far enough away from each other. And uh, this is this is Canary Three from uh, um, SLU as well. And for this, I was using the uh, Schmidt astrograph, which is an f two point two Celestron, eleven inch. So it's a really nice wide field, and it didn't take many integrations to get this one. Just uh, I think it just took three three fifty second shots to get uh, quite a nice shot of uh, the Pleiades. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, it worked out really well. I was quite surprised. I was thinking I was going to have to take more integrations, but I didn't, I didn't have to. Yeah, no, no need for more. No need for more. Uh, the last one was the beginning of October, and uh, this is called the Unusual Nebula. Um, <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is a Southern Constellation object as well. And uh, it, it, David, we sh I showed this before and David was pointing out that I didn't really have a wide enough field of view and he's quite correct. I have finished with this object though. I'm just not gonna bother it anymore. It's just too much of a fight uh, because uh, as it turns out, SLU doesn't have a wide enough um, uh, field of view optic in, this, in uh, Chile to uh, do this thing justice. But I did get a pretty good result of the central core. Uh, this is astronomy picture of the day. This shows the filamentation that I would have loved to have captured, but unfortunately I only got this area in here. So Joe, Joe, are you able to do mosaics? Could you specify coordinates? And Absolutely I could do that, yeah. but it's it's pretty fussy to do that with SLU, but you can certainly do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll stop there. Well, thanks, Joe. Okay. Yeah, That's thanks, great. Joe. Those were good. Yeah. And it's certainly a great opportunity to uh, be able to get some, as you say, data from somewhere else. And when we're uh, having bad conditions, so one of the yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good alternative. Um, there certainly are limitations. 
um, their scheduling system is uh, hard to use and uh, uh, their instruments are not all optimal. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think they, they need maintenance. And they I do. think they've had, yeah. they've, they've had difficulties with the pandemic getting to each of the scopes, so. Yeah, we have to cut them some slack and for the amount of money you pay them, it's, uh, we can't complain too loudly. Very good. Well, thanks again. So I think we're now at Lori. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, for, for the people who came out to our FDA uh, annual meeting on uh, Saturday night. And, and uh, those of you who also were on um, the YouTube to hear uh, Brenda Matthews talk about the ALMA. Um, we had uh, we had some again some beautiful pictures afterwards from uh, from David Lee and friends, which is uh, which was great. And we also showed the um, the video uh, that they took that the Plaskett um, uh, crowd took to when they reilluminized the mirror uh, just recently. They've just been doing that in the past month or so, and they have a really kind of cool little four minute video that. Uh, uh, that uh, shows exactly how it's all done. So maybe is that, I, is that, is that online yet, uh, Laurie? I, I, I think it's going on a, on their Facebook uh, this week. Uh, so I, I'll make sure that we can get it. Maybe what I can do is make sure that we've got something for next week so that I can, that we can show it because it really is quite, uh, quite interesting uh, to see the whole process of it being done. So that, that was number one. Um, number two is that I got a phone call from Elizabeth Griffin, who is one of the, the observers um, emeritus up at the uh, up at the center, and she had been um, to the uh, to the widow of Frank Younger, the the gentleman who just died um, recently uh, from the hill, and uh, she is now divesting herself of some of the some of the wonderful things I guess that Frank had in his house. And one of the things that she has, and I was wondering whether or not any one of the RESC might like, or if, if, if it could be used by anybody, is a, uh, an astro compass, um, which uh, made by a WW Bose company. Um, she's not exactly sure of, the, of how old it is, but it comes in a lovely little wooden box. It's about 10 centimeters by Three or four centimeters, and is um, it's called a compass, as an astro compass. And I thought, knowing Randy, he might be very interested <laughs> in something like this that was um, um, uh, historical. I just I'm going to pick it up from her on Thursday, and if anybody's interested in seeing this and figuring out what um, uh, you know whether it can be used, um, then it would be uh, would be something um, to do. And then the third thing that I wanted to was. The, um, the National RASC um, Education and Public Outreach Group is um, putting together a group of people from, uh, from the centers to start to um, for, form uh, an Eclipse 2023, Eclipse 2024 um, group. And we, we, what we'd like is to have somebody that is a contact from each one of the centers um, to meet, you know, maybe once every month or couple of months or something like that in 2022 to start getting things organized um, for that. Now, I know out in our way, uh, we've got, I mean, we're a little closer to the 2023 annular, but um, we still want to be able to disseminate information. So if anybody's interested in, um, uh, in wanting to uh, be just a rep and, it, and for 2022, I mean, what we're doing is just trying to get that organized we're not saying that you have to stay on for all of you know for the next three years or anything like this for this just but just having somebody that can go to a go to a, a couple of meetings uh, meet with the group to find out what's going on and uh, and what we can do so if there's anybody interested that would be great and uh, just um, contact me and um, and I can get you set up with the with the eclipse with the eclipse group so. thanks that's all I had. Great. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, that would be neat. So if you have the um, Astro Compass there next week, maybe you could, we can see if we could at least see it at your yes, site. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
for sure. Yes, it looks very interesting. I was just quickly um, looking it up on Google to see if I could find an example of what it does. So yeah, I think Randy might be interested now. I think he, he's, and maybe, maybe Sid, is Sid on? <laughs> Not tonight, no. But... Yeah, I, actually, I think, I think Randy would, uh, would be interested in this. It, it looks like it's, um, well, it, it, it's machine the way he likes it. I mean, it's certainly, yeah. certainly yeah. old school. <laughs> yeah, yes. Original kind of thing. So yeah, and it looks like it's kind of sextant-like in a way. Yes, it's yeah, a, that's I, what I, I mean. It was called a micro sextant. <laughs> okay. Like that, so yeah. Yeah. So it's it says it's for uh, determining the direction of true north for navigation, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So yeah. stay tuned. It could be that Mrs. Younger has got other interesting things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Maybe if you, uh, yeah, if you have an opportunity to. Uh, yeah, I it don't looks like it's I an see. aircraft compass. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be the reference, isn't it? World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, just mm -hmm. a reminder, too, we were talking at the beginning. Um, we are expecting a guest speaker on November 15th, so two weeks tonight. And uh, David will uh, is, is arranging that uh, speaker, so we'll see what... Uh, Make sure we confirm that. Um, and I think that's all we had formally for this evening. So I don't know if anybody else has anything they'd like to discuss or ask about. But I guess we can have a open chat or. I have a footnote if you want. Uh, for those of you who are interested in electric cars and seeing the Aurora, uh, there's a 17 minute video on YouTube by Tesla Bjorn goes as Bjorn Nyland and it's uh it's a trip from Oslo up into the north central part of Norway uh, in a Mercedes EQC and he gets up to where there's some clear skies and has some really uh, nice videos of of the aurora from there. Hmm. Hmm. Okay thank you yeah. I thought you were going to say that he found a way to charge the uh, Tesla with the Aurora. <laughs> there we are, yeah. I was looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? Joe, you'd like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, Nor Norway has the most northerly uh, charging stations already. <laughs> right. Yeah. He does stop and charge it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Anyone else with anything? Okay. I'll pipe up here. I'm heading south this Thursday. Ah. And my oh. so my observing session starts in about two weeks. But right. The big, the big news is my good wife has decided that she'd rather hang out with grandkids than hang out in Arizona. So we're putting the joint up for sale. So there you go. Ah. So what about the what about the observatory? I've, so I've, I've, I've secured a place for the scopes. And uh, I don't know about the building yet on a farm just north of Sandishton. Ah, so they'll be soon become yes. Canadian telescopes. Right. <laughs> so there you go. That's big, awesome. Big That's good news. Big changes for us. I live just around Sandishton. <laughs> there we are. So the oh, you, uh, do. <laughs> you, do, you do do you? Okay, there you go. Yeah. So yep. the VCO South will become the VCO North. Yeah, that's yes. it. There you go. Yes. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. So we'll see what I'll keep you. I'll keep you uh, updated as to when the place actually sells. Uh, hopefully, it's sells. Who knows? Well, it's a beautiful spot. I'm. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what the demand is like. Going down south. Yeah, we're going down right away. So who, who, who are you talking to, Laurie? Sorry, I was asking Peter Jedicky. I saw him online. I just wondered if he was going down south. Maybe not on Hi, hi Lori. Yes, um, we're 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 gonna spend the winter in Hawaii this year. Oh, in Hawaii. Uh, oh, okay. Different south. <laughs> yeah, different yeah. South. I, we're still. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not sure how worried everybody is about crossing the border with a car. I mean, you know, two months ago they were weren't even letting us do it in Ontario. I'm not sure if the rules were different in BC. Well, so we just decided not to take a chance on Tucson this year. So you're not taking a car to Hawaii, I hope. Correct. That was that was one of the uh, key factors. Yes. 
<laughs> That's a long bridge. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe someday Mr. Tesla will build a tunnel under underneath the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> not while not while COVID is there. <laughs> yeah. He'll have a fly with cars someday. So which, which island are you going to? Sorry, what was the question? Where are you going and which island? Oh, oh um, my brother and his wife live, uh, they work in Honolulu and they live on the north side of the ridge right. behind Honolulu. Beautiful. Good place to be. Polynesian Cultural Center. Right, exactly. Yeah, not that far north though, right? But you can go, go up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, the, I mean, I'm trying to remember the shape of the island, but where Honolulu is, it's not a far ride over to the other side to, where the Pacific is also to the north. Yeah. Right? The island is kind of, it's not shaped exactly round. No, they figured that was, a, may have been a, um, a, quite a big volcano and half of it sank. I guess that's why it's kind of got that odd shape, they think, maybe. So well, as long as half of it's left. As long as that doesn't happen while we're there, I'm not. That's sure. right. <laughs> Very good. Excuse me. Anybody else have anything for this evening? Maybe, uh, maybe I should say a word about Hubble. It's sure. right back in uh, uh, safe mode again. Oh dear. Excuse me. So uh, let's see. I just um, this happened about uh, ten days ago. Hubble Science. In, I'm just reading something here. Hubble Science Instruments in, uh, issued error codes uh, at 1:46 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on October 23rd indicating the loss of a specific synchronization message. It provides timing uh, information for the instruments uh, that the instruments use to respond to data requests and commands. And, um, and then they reset it. Uh, they reset the instruments and a couple of days later, uh, more error codes came out. So uh, they've gone into, um, uh, safe mode again, and uh, and so uh, people, the uh, folks uh, working on Hubble are taking a few days to try and figure out what what has happened. And uh, these activities are expected to take at least one week, and the rest of the spacecraft is operating as normal. So uh, so uh, this is. Um, this is somewhat different from what we were dealing with this summer, but anyway, uh, um, right now it's not operating. And of course, they're most anxious that it does operate when uh, JWST is launched. Um, when actually will that happen? Do JWST, it's supposed to go up on December 18th. At last. December 18th. And uh, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, coming out right now about how JST, JWST works. I think uh, CSA is having some sort of uh, online thing tomorrow, which might even, part of which might even be on NASA TV. Uh, and uh, they've put up a bunch of stuff on their site in the last, the last couple of days because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Canada is, is building has built an instrument and 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 some of the other equipment for uh, JWST. It what actually was not a formal part of Hubble, um, so uh, but this this time it is, and uh, so it launches on December eighteenth, and it's going to take some time before it actually gets to where it needs to go and for everything to unfold. That's we're talking about a couple of months, I think. Uh, for all that. Chris, when they fixed the Hubble recently, um, they had to fail over to some existing system. Uh, that's not in the cards this go around, is it? This seems they... to be a whole, a whole different thing. It's different. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's no more places to go. 
or no it's too far away oh for uh for repair i'm just wondering if there's no more no more options well for for hubble and this would be the case with jwst at least officially that uh you know it's there and we're here and you know so it has to uh you know they have to figure it out on earth and 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 send the proper commands uh to deal with this but there, there's no option to send somebody up there to uh, oh no i'm not thinking of that i'm just thinking of existing failover systems that hubble has access to uh if 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 there are no more you know no more options to to take to bring it back oh, for, for, for hubble <laughs> yeah, uh, in this case, I don't know because. Hey, Chris, uh, or somebody smart, someone should uh, explain to us uh, how uh, uh, um, JW, JWST can orbit around a Lagrange point. I don't get that yet. Okay. Peter. Peter Smart. It's just uh, Peter's getting started. <laughs> Peter, I just say you shared a link too. Thank you for putting that up. Oh well, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Chris mentioned the JWST event tomorrow. That's the link for it. It's at um, if I know the time zones. If we got the time zones right, it's twenty thirty for you guys. Thank you. Now, as for the um, Lagrange point, um, yeah. Thank you for your confidence in me. I, I don't know if I have a really clever way of explaining it. I've been thinking about this stuff for forty five years. You remember there was a there was a space advocacy group for students really called the L5 Society back in the 1970s. There was a Princeton University professor named Gerard K. O'Neill who wrote a book and had a proposal to build large orbiting cylinders uh, and put like a million human beings in each one. And his, uh, his bottom line, or maybe his top line was let's get humanity off the planet because we've screwed this world up, let's go somewhere else. And he wanted to put folks in space. And his idea was to put these things orbiting around the Lagrange points around the L4 and L5 points. Now, my understanding is that the L4 and L5 points are gravitational wells, they're stable. If you drop something in the L4 or L5, in the vicinity of L4 or L5, the object will kind of vibrate back and forth and settle in either at L4 or L5. L1, L2, and L3 are not stable in the same way, but you can still orbit around them if you've got the right amount of energy. Um, now, the other night, the, well, I wouldn't be able to find this on short notice. There, there was a really pretty good video that somebody showed on one of the online things, uh, I presume it was from NASA, where it showed this orbit of the JWST. It's only orbiting around L2, from the point of view of an observer who is outside, sort of back beyond the Earth. So if you if you imagine setting yourself out, out about maybe two or three million kilometers farther from the sun than the Earth, and imagine yourself somehow able to magically keep your eye aimed at the Earth towards the sun, kind of like you know, having the Earth eclipse the sun, then L2 is right there between you. And it looks like JWST is doing a loop around the L2 point. But if you were able to look at it from an independent point of view above on an angle or something, and you're able to see the Earth going in its revolution around the sun, what happens is JWST seems to be going up and down, up and down behind the Earth as it moves around. So in other words, it's got a, basically a one-year orbit but it's a million kilometers further from the Earth, and it's rising above and below the ecliptic, whatever it is, every you know, every six weeks or whatever. How I don't know, I don't know what the period of that thing is. Did that help at all? A wee bit, yeah, yeah. And by the way, Chris, you're one of those smart people. I, I think, don't think I said that right. Chris or a smart person. It was Chris and other smart people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Doing my best. Yeah, I'm doing better than most. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see. Well, I hope we'll hope everything works out and then we can, uh, yeah, see how it, uh, uh, hopefully they'll get it up into the right location and then it will uh, uh, deploy itself properly too. So. Yeah.
Yeah, here's but hoping. He's gone. I'm just seeing that Chris has posted a different link. Is that not the same event then, Chris? Is that you've got there? Because the, the event that I've got is, a, is at 17.30 Hawaii time. So maybe it's just the University of Hawaii thing. Oh. Yeah, if there's a media event tomorrow at uh, oh, tomorrow 11 a.m. Eastern time, I'll want, I'll want to be watching that. Cool. Yeah, you can see, you can, you can just get it on uh, NASA TV or something yeah. like that. So yeah, I'll make a note of that and I'll, 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 I'll watch that tomorrow morning. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, the, the Hawaii thing. I hadn't heard about that one. So uh, yeah, I have to admit, I just wrote down the link for that and the time. Um, so I didn't write down who's sponsoring or holding that. So I guess I made the mistake of just jumping to the conclusion that it's the same event you were talking about, but it's apparently not. Yeah. Well, I have something down for Natalie Willette talking at 11 in the morning. Natalie Willette, okay. From, you know, from Montreal who does the, you know, who's doing some of that stuff. So I, but I don't have a, I don't have my link, a link in there. I just have it in my calendar. So I'd have to go back and check on it. But there's lots and lots of things going on. Like the RASC has got a bunch of, a bunch of things, and um, and yeah, there was uh, the uh, the RESC bulletin that came out this morning. Yeah, the newsletter uh, has got some stuff in it. Yes, it 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 has a link to uh, uh, I can't remember if it's the CSA or NASA web website that had all sorts of information. It's CSA. Yeah, CSA. Yeah. Hey, Chris, we should have a online Zoom get together to watch the liftoff. Chris Purse. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Early, it's early in the morning, isn't it? What time is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it possibly will be. Eh? If it's, uh... I actually I haven't heard anything about the time of day it is, but uh, is it? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you know. Uh, the odds are, you know, it's not necessarily going to be at a particularly convenient time. So, but we'll see. But yeah, uh, hope doesn't blow up. It'll be on NASA TV. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe even some of the uh, networks will deign to show it too. You know, so uh, yeah, it's a pretty important mission, after all. You know, as we've said. So, well, the FAO has got our our winter solstice party. Saturday night star party that night as well. The December, right. so so we'll be we'll be doing some uh, some review on that a little bit later too. So maybe we oh, can. Hopefully it'll be uh, a celebratory nature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We hope. Yeah. Let's, let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> even in even in the you know the best best of circumstances. Uh, uh, you know, there'll still be a, a lot of things to kind of wait out before. Uh, yes. Oh, two well, months. Two months to for it to get to its Lagrange point. Well, I think I think it takes, I think it takes about a month or something, but uh, there's a lot of unfolding and setting up and testing and all this other stuff to do. It'll be so, a while until uh, it's working, even at the best rate. I think. So it'll be it'll be March before we see images. Yes, I would think so. Yeah, some of the unfolding apparently happens while it's en route, which is kind of yes. Odd. Oh yeah, some of it will. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's some of it will happen well. happen very very shortly after after. Well, no reason why not. There's no air resistance. It yeah. can it can unfold itself whenever yeah. it likes. Yeah, except for the. Uh, particles that might run into along the way but yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah meteor micro particles <laughs> details right. details yeah <laughs> very good does well, anybody else have anything this evening maybe that's it that's it yeah so there we are maybe uh, 55 minutes today well thank you thank yeah. you chris well, thanks Thank for you. joining us, everyone, and we'll uh, yeah we'll see everybody next week. And a reminder again, we should have a guest speaker two weeks tonight, and 
Um, so that should be something, uh, a special event to look forward to as well. So again, thank you for joining us and take care everyone. Good night all.